Thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of the Hellenic American Leadership Council and uh, the AJC, uh, I'm pleased to present Ms. Rachel Bronson and Sir Michael Lee, uh, who will lead our discussion tonight on energy developments in the Eastern Mediterranean. And um, I want to thank them for taking the time to speak to us. Uh, as many of you know, energy developments and discoveries are changing the landscape, the geopolitical landscape of the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, energy discoveries in the region um, feature prominently in conversation among policymakers and experts and have the potential to impact European uh, plans for energy security to transform local economies and to improve re uh, relations and cooperation among neighbors, something that we've seen uh, in particular with uh, Greece, Cyprus, and Israel. And um, like I said, we're extremely likely to have two distinguished policy experts with us tonight who will uh, take the time to help us understand what's happening and what to expect in the future. Uh, a little bit about both of our guests. Sir Michael Lee uh, currently serves as Senior Advisor to the German Marshall Fund of the United States since 2011. Prior to, his, uh, prior to this, Dr. Lee was Director General of Enlargement at the European Commission from 2006 to 2011, and as such served as the Chief European Union Negotiator with candidate countries. From 2003 to 2006, he served as Deputy Director General uh, for External Relations. He received his PhD in Political Science from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1974, and has served as visiting professor of international relations at the Bologna Center, John Hopkins University's uh, School for Advanced International Studies, or SAIS. Um, and as we were told during our briefing call last week with uh, Sir Michael, um, he also worked on the negotiations that led to Greece joining then, uh, the then European community. Uh, Ms. Rachel Bronson is currently the executive director and publisher of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, where she oversees the publishing programs uh, the management of the doomsday clock, and a growing set of activities around nuclear weapons, nuclear energy, climate change, and emerging technologies. Uh, she has served for eight years at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and has served as a senior fellow and director of Middle East Studies at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations in New York and as an adjunct professor at Columbia University. Her writings have appeared in hundreds of publications including Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, the National Interest, the New York Times, the Washington Post, Huffington Post, and the Chicago Tribune. Um, before moving on to our program, I just want to acknowledge uh, the Council General of Greece, Ms. Uh, Polixeni Petropoulou, for uh, thank you for attending. And um, I want to extend a special thank you to Hinshaw and Culbertson, and particularly Mr. Uh, Nick Legados, for hosting us tonight. Thank you. And. Um, I want to say thank you to Mr. Costa Stamatakos from Hellenic Heartbeat for coming out to film the event. And uh, obviously, I want to thank my colleagues, Andy and Georgia, for all the help that they've, uh, and work they've done for this event. And of course, our friends at AJC, Ali Turkle and uh, Amy Miller, for helping us put this together. So without further ado, let's get started. Thank you very much indeed for those um, warm words of welcome, Thanos. It's a great pleasure to be with you here. Thanks for coming out on this stormy night. Um, I just about came in before the rain began, and we're going to talk long enough so that the rain can stop uh, when, we, when we come to leave. Um, pleasure to be here with, with Rachel and uh, with AGC and, uh, and Hulk to talk about a subject that has um, been very high on my agenda for the last uh, five or six years. I began to take an interest in the question of energy in the Eastern Mediterranean and its geopolitical implications and challenges coming out of my work with the European Commission. In my last job at the European Commission, as uh, Thanos mentioned, I was responsible for the accession negotiations and also for the assistance program for the Turkish Cypriot community. I was uh, previously responsible for relations with Israel and Egypt. So all of this was very close to my experience. And shortly after I left the commission in 2011, drilling began offshore Cyprus. And at that point, uh, Turkey began to make threatening noises. And it struck me that here was um, a situation <coughs> which could well carry risks as well as benefits. And I wrote an article warning about the risks of escalation. And then I devised a project 
whose main theme is how the energy discoveries in the Eastern Mediterranean can be used for the benefit of all the peoples concerned and should not become a new source of conflict. And this project has been running now for four years. We have over 20 publications and we've looked at diverse aspects of the question. And I'm going to share some of these with you uh, this evening. I'll also touch on a number of political questions, including the Cyprus uh, settlement talks, which are very much related to this, as well as relations uh, between Turkey and Russia, Israel and Russia, um, the interest of the United States and the European Union in what's taking place in this part of the world. And then I'd be happy to go into any of these questions in more detail with you a little later. So just a few words of background uh, to begin with. As uh, Rachel recalled in her paper that has uh, been distributed to you, um, this very nice saying of Golda Meir that uh, Israel seemed to be the only country in the Middle East uh, with no uh, energy. And this was taken for granted to be the situation for, for decades. And Israel was dependent on imports of heavy fuel oil uh, and, and coal, which were extremely costly and uh, polluting. And then, um, beginning in 1999, uh, exploration began offshore. And another a number of discoveries were made which transformed uh, the situation. The, um, what you see in this map is a large part of the Levant Basin, um, a basin offshore um, Israel. You don't see on the map the uh, Palestinian um, Authority, um, Lebanon, Syria, uh, Cyprus, and Turkey. And in 2010, the uh, United States Geological Survey estimated that the total reserves of natural gas in this area were some 122 trillion cubic feet. Not everybody takes this estimate seriously. It's based on seismic surveys. It may be rather less than that. But I think it's important, before we go any further, for you to situate that um, in global terms. So supposing that was approximately true, and the area holds something like 100 trillion cubic feet. So the world discoveries of natural gas are of the order of 7,000 trillion. Okay, so it's 100 out of 7,000 trillion. If you compare it with one or two countries to see the order of magnitude, what has been discovered in the United States until now is around 350 trillion uh, cubic feet. In the whole of Europe, around 130. So it's more or less the same order of magnitude as Europe. Iran, 1,200 uh, trillion cubic feet and Qatar uh, almost 900 trillion. So without going into more uh, numbers here, what you can see is that these discoveries were extremely significant for the countries concerned, and we'll come to that in, in, a, f in a few moments, but not a game changer in global terms. For Israel, um, the discovery of the Tamar field here um, in 2009, alone is sufficient to provide for Israel's predictable needs for a period of approximately 40 years. But in addition to Tamar, um, a group of companies led by Noble Energy of Houston, Texas, also discovered um, this very large field here, whose name suggests the size of the field, Leviathan, um, whose size has also been estimated variously at between 17 trillion uh, cubic feet, a low estimate, to 22 trillion uh, cubic feet. And the other really major discovery is very, very close to Leviathan, within the exclusive econo economic zone of Cyprus, the Aphrodite field. And this field uh, has, has been estimated at between 3 and 5 trillion cubic feet. The whole of the Levant Basin's gas is more or less equivalent to one year's global consumption 
um, today with present levels of demand. Cyprus and Israel together could, if Leviathan and Aphrodite were developed, which they have not been developed yet, um, they could export 25 billion cubic meters for a period of 20 years. That, for example, is 50% of overall demand in Turkey. And it's one-sixth of the amount of gas that Russia sells to Europe. So again, the order of magnitude, very significant for the countries concerned. It could make a useful contribution in countries like Turkey and perhaps the European Union, but not such as to change the overall supply and demand situation beyond the region. It's worth recalling that just to the south, and we don't quite see it on this map, but we can see it on the other map that I brought along, um, Egypt is a very major producer now of natural gas. And Egypt um, has recently made additional large offshore discoveries, particularly in a field known as Zor, that is very close, in fact, to Aphrodite. And uh, the Zor field has been estimated at uh, 30 trillion cubic feet, reduced somewhat from the original expectations, but nonetheless extremely significant. So this has become really um, a gas-rich region, which transforms it from a situation in which it was previously um, obliged to import gas um, from world markets and to import heavy fuel oil, which was highly polluting. By today, if you take Israel, gas from Tamar produces 60% of Israel's electricity. It has changed very much the um, environmental situation in Israel. Uh, if, you, if you go to Tel Aviv, there always used to be a cloud of pollution over the city, which is more or less uh, gone now. And another effect that is already felt is concerning water. If we'd been having this meeting uh, maybe six, seven years ago, certainly ten years ago, people were confidently predicting that water would be the next source of major conflict in the Middle East. Well, as a result of the energy discoveries, water is no longer an issue. Uh, through desalinization, which is highly energy intensive, Israel has been able to produce enough uh, fresh water for all its agricultural needs. And there's also some question of exporting water to Jordan. So any fear that water could be the uh, reason for some um, future conflict between Israel and its neighbors has, has diminished um, as a result of this. Cyprus also has begun uh, desalinization with two plants, although it has not yet been able to bring its gas uh, on stream. <coughs> now these gas discoveries took place in a region where there are extremely long-running political conflicts. And the question really is whether the gas can serve as a means to help to overcome some of these conflicts or whether it will exacerbate them. Obviously, there is the conflict between Israel and its neighbors. Israel, for example, is still technically in a state of war with Lebanon. Both Israel and Lebanon have delimited their exclusive economic zone with Cyprus. However, when they did it, there was a difference about where the meeting point should be in between these two, between these two zones. You don't see it on this map, but in reality, there's like a pizza slice here of 850 square kilometers that is contested. So in addition to the political conflicts in the region, here is a conflict over the delimitation. Another additional conflict that is related to these resources is uh, between Turkey and Cyprus. 
Under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, coastal states are entitled to a 200-mile exclusive economic zone, which is uh, drawn from base points on their coast. If uh, the distance between two countries is less than twice 200 um, miles, they have to negotiate the uh, delimitation based on certain principles set out in the convention. Neither Israel nor Turkey um, are parties to the convention, but nonetheless, um, it, it, Israel seeks to be guided by the principles of the convention. Turkey's basic position is that its continental shelf generates a 200-mile exclusive economic zone, and Cyprus, as an island in an enclosed sea, has a right only to a 12-mile territorial sea, in Turkey's view. Turkey considers that it ought to delimit its own 200-mile zone with Egypt as if Cyprus were not there. And for this reason, as well as a reason related to the um, Cyprus problem, Turkey challenges the right of Cyprus to license blocks offshore. And every time that there has been a licensing round and every time that drilling has begun, uh, Turkey has manifested its displeasure, sent a vessel into the zone, an exploration vessel, and um, even threatened to send uh, naval vessels. The other reason why Turkey challenges the right of Cyprus to allocate these zones and to explore and develop its resources is because of the Cyprus conflict. And it maintains that until there is a comprehensive settlement, um, that uh, there should be a kind of moratorium on the development of these resources. And, and, and that the resources should be there for both of the communities on the island. The government of the Republic of Cyprus accepts that the resources should be shared between the Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot community, and um, nonetheless, uh, supported by the United States and by the European Union, does not feel that it needs to wait until there's a settlement before developing these resources. So you have this uh, conflict between Le uh, Lebanon and Israel. You have the delimitation conflict uh, between Turkey um, and, and Cyprus. Now, when these resources were developed, the view was taken that in order for the companies to monetize sufficiently their discoveries, it was necessary to find export markets. This is a view that can be challenged, but it was the prevailing wisdom. Obviously, in the case of Cyprus, given the size of its resources, the three uh, to five trillion cubic feet discovered in Aphrodite, Cyprus itself, on any assumptions, could only consume uh, under 10% of these resources. In Israel's case, it could perhaps consume um, over 40 years what would be produced from Tamar, uh, but um, Leviathan hasn't been developed yet, and so it too potentially has a surplus for export. The companies have been extremely keen on the principle of exporting gas, believing that they could uh, reap higher profits from this than if they confined themselves to sales um, within uh, the countries concerned. Now, when I first uh, took an interest in this question four or five years ago, the assumption was, and all the discussion was about export to world markets. And a very popular scheme for doing this at the time was the construction of a liquefied natural gas plant at Basilikos in the south of Cyprus. And all the attention focused on this possibility. It was at a time when gas prices were rather high, particularly in the Far East, and to some extent in Europe, and there were these rather grandiose visions of this gas being exported all over the world. However, in the intervening period, a new realism has dawned about this. I think it's been clear now, given what has happened to energy prices, and given the relatively modest, by global standards, discoveries that have been made, that it would be better, certainly for Israel 
uh, and perhaps for Cyprus too, to concentrate first of all on domestic sales and then on the immediate region. So, um, in, the, in, in, in the last few years, the principal interest when it comes to possible export markets has been the possibility of exporting gas um, to Egypt. Until 2011, Israel imported gas from Egypt, but because of frequent terrorist attacks in the Sinai Desert and the existing pipeline passes through part of the Sinai Desert, and also because of certain problems of unpaid bills, um, this was discontinued. And on the contrary, uh, Egypt has now become an importer. So for a long time, the idea was that Cyprus and Israel could both focus their attention on the Egyptian market. And here there were two ideas. One was that the gas could be used for domestic demand in Egypt, with very high growing demand, growing population, increasing number of cars, and so on. And the other was that this gas could be sent to two unused liquefied natural gas plants in Egypt, owned by British Gas that has now been taken over BG by, by Shell, and a consortium, Union Fenosa of Spain and uh, ENI of Italy. And they could make use of these LNG plants and export them to world markets. The only problem with this is you would have to construct uh, pipelines to uh, Egypt, you would have to develop the fields, and um, you would have to come to an understanding with the Egyptian authorities who would have to approve the deal. This has been the dominant hypothesis for the last couple of years. But I think it's going out of fashion, as it were, now. Why? First of all, the extremely high development costs. We're in the order of magnitude of six or seven uh, billion dollars. Given the drop in energy prices, it's been very hard to find investors who see a commercial benefit and an investment of that scale. Political uncertainty uh, in Egypt and declining demand for LNG on world markets, where there is a large glut of LNG for the moment. So this assumption, I would say, although it's still discussed, um, there was just a meeting uh, today uh, in, in Brussels, and the um, uh, Cypriot energy minister again spoke of this possibility, but I think it's looking less and less likely. The other uh, perhaps most logical export market is Turkey itself. Um, Turkey is of interest because of its proximity, because of the fact that the southern corridor is being constructed through Turkey um, into Southeast Europe, and therefore Turkey could be a transit country for this gas to reach Southeast Europe. And also, more recently, Turkey's political uh, difficulties with Russia after the shooting down of the Russian plane last November and the, 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 the chill in relations between Turkey and Russia means that Turkey might itself like to deliver uh, a message to Russia that it has other potential sources um, of, of energy. But there are fundamental obstacles here, too. Israeli companies have been in conversation with Turkish companies and uh, Cypriot companies indirectly uh, through Israel also about the possibility of constructing a pipeline to Turkey. However, such a pipeline would have to pass through the exclusive economic zone of Lebanon and of Syria, one possibility, excluded for political reasons for the time being, or else through the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus. And as long as there's no settlement of the Cyprus problem, clearly the government of the Republic of Cyprus is not going to give their permission uh, for the construction of such a pipeline. And Turkey would have political difficulties as well. So for the moment, this export option also seems to be closed, at least pending a Cyprus settlement. And we can talk about that process, if you wish, a little later. Even more fanciful schemes have been developed uh, uh, with a view to exporting the, the gas to Europe. 
a very uh, popular notion which the European Commission has in a way put forward as a possibility without being ready to finance it, is that either a gas pipeline or an undersea electricity cable could be built from Cyprus to Crete, we don't have it on this map, and then onto the Peloponnese and into Southeast Europe. Problem with this is 1,200 kilometers in length. If it were to be an export for electricity, a great deal is lost. There are huge technical issues. Um, the seabed is 3,000 meters deep. Um, and between Cyprus and Crete, there's something like an undersea uh, mountain range. Huge technical, financial, and practical issues. Nonetheless, the European Union um, is seeking to diversify its energy supplies away from Russia. And at least politically, the message that the European Union is interested and that the Eastern Mediterranean could be a source of diversification away from Russia is um, an attractive notion. However, in more recent discussions, I think a second wave of realism has occurred. The first wave of realism was not to think so much about global markets, but rather regional markets. Egypt, the Palestinian Authority, and potentially Jordan. We can talk about Jordan, if you wish, um, a little later. But the second round of realism is to say, well, perhaps in the first instance, for Israel at least, it should concentrate on um, the domestic market. And a problem that Israel is facing right now is it only has one source of supply, which is Tamar, with one pipeline, which from a security point of view is very risky. So people are considering in Israel whether it might not be better to build redundancy into their uh, supply of gas by um, developing initially a pipeline from Leviathan so there would be two sources going into Israel. And then people in Israel are looking at how gas can be used more intensively in transport, in agriculture, and by other means. I mentioned Jordan a few moments ago. And in principle, the Jordanian authorities are interested in importing gas from, from Israel and potentially uh, Cyprus. But it is seen as politically sensitive. Whenever there are incidents on the Temple Mount or what have you, there are voices in Jordan against it. So for the time being, there's a modest project to export gas uh, to two companies across the Red Sea, uh, the Dead Sea in, in Jordan, very small quantities. And the thinking now is it might be better for Israel to export um, gas products which is to say uh, principally electricity and water to Jordan rather than gas uh, itself. So there has been much discussion about these export options, but for the time being, Israel, I think, is focusing more on its domestic market, which leaves the problem of Cyprus. The dilemma of Cyprus is that because the domestic market is too small, there's a risk of these very large discoveries in Aphrodite becoming stranded gas and not being developed at all for want of an export market. And for the time being, it's not clear what that export market would be. If the current talks for a Cyprus settlement succeed, then two things will happen. The possibility of export to Turkey would appear again. And furthermore, um, the European Union would come in with considerable financial support for reshaping the whole energy sector in Cyprus through the European Investment Bank, which is the largest public lender in the world for projects such as uh, energy, uh, telecommunications, uh, and other major civil engineering projects. And perhaps public funds could come in in this way from the EU to help with the initial costs uh, of development. A final thought before we open up to some discussion, and that is uh, Russia. In Israel, one of the obstacles to developing this gas for many years have been differences about the regulatory regime. Israel has not been a traditional energy producing country, and its rules about taxation, about the amount that can be exported, and its an antitrust rules uh, were not originally drawn up with a view to becoming a major energy producer. And they have shifted quite a bit over the years. 
and particularly over the last two years, an obstacle to the development of Leviathan has been um, shifting Israeli positions on antitrust, which has actually held up the development of Leviathan, quite apart from the question of an export market. One of the results of this um, debate has been to require that the companies most involved should divest themselves of some of their holdings so that it's not just going to be one group of companies that owns the different um, wells in, in the region. And this divestment uh, process could go further. Mr. Putin has indicated that Russia might well be interested. So there's a possibility that Gazprom might be one of the companies that could make a bid in the event of the divestment uh, taking place. And the Israeli authorities seem to be not averse to this, which is rather in contradiction with the EU interest in this area for diversifying supplies away from um, Russia. But the political climate in Israel, particularly after the most recent developments, is perhaps rather favorable to this. Mr. Lieberman and his party have just become defense minister today, as you may know, originally from Russia, and rather positive on the whole towards cooperation with Russia. With one million Russian speakers in Israel, uh, the Israelis have been very cautious for a long time about questions concerning Russia. For example, they did not participate in the UN vote after the annexation of Crimea. So there is just a possibility that um, Russia might find its way into this picture, not because it needs the gas, but simply because it doesn't wish to see this development taking place in the absence of its interests, and also, it doesn't want to see Turkey becoming, with whom it now also has a political conflict, um, the transit route for this gas to reach um, Europe. A final complication, which perhaps is on the way to disappearing, has been the chill in relations between Israel and Turkey since 2009. The normalization talks have gone very well, and they seem always to be just approaching a settlement without quite getting there. For for now. But if relations are normalized between Israel and Turkey, then this prospect of possible export through Turkey that Russia um, does not want to see could come back on the agenda. So here is a complicated picture with resources that could provide tremendous benefits superimposed on a number of pre-existing and long-standing political conflicts, the gas already providing certain real benefits but the two largest fields not developed yet because of some of the issues that I mentioned to you. And in the case of Cyprus, the risk that the Aphrodite field could actually be stranded gas until and unless a Cyprus settlement uh, permits one or the other options for export markets to be developed. So probably that's uh, too much by way of an introduction, but let me stop there. Thank you so much. So the, um, the program tonight calls for us to have just a brief conversation uh, up here and then open it up for questions. So I'll limit my, my, the discussion a bit so we can um, get to the, uh, to the group's conversation. I was wondering if you, could, if you had any insight about uh, where you think the antitrust battles in Israel are going. It's, it's a very fascinating situation. Obviously, Israel suddenly becomes a gas producer and has no history of it, so they haven't worked all these issues out. But I thought what you said, Michael, was so, I hadn't thought about it before, which is you know, the Israelis are concerned with antitrust. You have this one company led by this leading Israeli who seek to benefit it. But if they diversify, you can just go to the Russians or whoever else. So, uh, what's your sense? Can you give us any um, way to think about the, where this antitrust battle and when Israel's going to get its act together to begin to develop Leviathan? There's been a very unrealistic um, debate in Israel about antitrust over the last two years. It comes from the fact that public opinion in Israel perceives uh, the development as being done by a small group of um, oligarchs um, and that these companies, they believe, are uh, arrogating the potential benefits of this gas to themselves. And this has been voiced by various uh, public movements in Israel which brought pressure on the authorities so that the antitrust regulator contested the basis for Noble Energy and its partners to go ahead with the development. 
and there have been various zigzags on this over the last two years. Finally, um, this week, uh, an agreement has been reached between the main consortium of uh, companies and the Israeli government. The last contentious issue was a clause in the so-called outline agreement between the government and the companies, which promised stability in regulatory matters um, over a, a lengthy period. And this went up to the Supreme Court, which challenged it. But the terms of the stability clause have now been modified, and it looks as though there's a new agreement. So I think, at least for the time being, um, this cannot be uh, contested further to the Supreme Court in Israel. It looks as though it's legally sound. So I hope this issue will now disappear and it will be possible for the companies to go ahead with the, the first steps towards development. It was interesting also to hear you talk about uh, Europe's, um, the potential for Europe to get involved to kind of help bring energy uh, to Europe itself. I, I've been struck, it seems to me that um, Europe's been fairly lethargic, if you will, that the, given how concerned they were just a few years ago about the Russian grip on uh, European sources, they haven't seemed to be terribly animated about investing or figuring it out or diplomatically. At least that seems to me from the outside, but you have a much closer personal engagement. Is, is Europe been more active? Or are you surprised by how it's it's well, we didn't mention at the beginning whether we were on the record or off the record. We're certainly in the presence of the Consul General. And the but <laughs> uh, but allow, me, uh, allow me to give my personal view on all of this, which is perhaps not the orthodox view. I have to remind myself that I no longer wear a formal EU hat, and I have uh, got my freedom of uh, thought and speech. <laughs> so um, I think there is a double process going on in Europe. I think the, Euro the European Commission, principally, has come up with the, the notion of an energy union. And let's face it, the main impulse behind this has been to become less dependent on Russia. The main concept is to develop a real energy market in Europe, because for the time being, there isn't. There are several different markets. The interconnectors are not built, and therefore there is no single market. And then some EU countries, uh, particularly some of the former communist countries, are still 100% dependent on Russia for imports of gas and to a considerable extent also um, for oil. So this is the formal policy and the European Commission has put forward various ideas, some of which are going ahead, for example, the construction of uh, regasification terminals for LNG in Lithuania, in Croatia and so on so that we should become less dependent on, on Russia. However, the EU's largest member state, the largest market for um, exports of gas from Russia, Germany, the second largest market is Turkey, um, has a major project, um, Nord Stream 2, which would have the effect of increasing uh, dependence on Russia from Russia's perspective, it would have the advantage of not requiring transit across Ukraine. And with all the tensions between Russia and Ukraine, this would be attractive from a Russian point of view. The German government maintains that there's, this is not political and that it's not a, a, a project of the German government. It's a commercial project. But there is a bit of a dilemma here, where the official policy of the European Union is energy union, diversification, but our largest member state implicitly or explicitly uh, uh, approves this project. So what you have is statements by senior EU representatives like um, Vice President uh, Mara Shevtovich, who is responsible for Energy Union, was in Washington a couple of weeks ago, comes very often, and talks up the prospect of the Eastern Med adding to Europe's energy diversity. He was in Cyprus just this week, you can read his statement, it's very interesting. And he puts forward this vision of uh, a pipeline uh, from the Eastern Med to Europe, or else the use of the Southern Corridor through Turkey, almost as if it were a near certainty. Whereas in fact, there are very many question marks here. So as on a number of issues, there's an official position, and there's the reality pursued by individual member states, 
and the two are not always identical by any means. Thank you, and maybe the last question for me, and, and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, you and I both received an email from Andy, who's, uh, who's, who's out in the region now, who, you know, watching current events and, and very engaged in them. Is, you talked a little bit about Cyprus, um, but are recent events changing how, how we should be thinking about the, the possibility of, of new energy arrangements, or is it kind of same old, same old? Everything will really depend on a Cyprus settlement. If there is a settlement this year, um, of, of a comprehensive settlement of, of, of the problem of the division of Cyprus, we'll be in a whole new uh, ball game. And then the prospect of exports to or through Turkey will become a political possibility. Whether or not investors will then come in with the necessary funds to build the infrastructure and the pipeline will still depend on commercial viability. And given the surplus of uh, energy supplies to demand on world markets today, given the very low prices, who knows whether this will happen. It could be still very attractive to Turkey. Turkey is paying ten, twelve uh, dollars um, to Iran, uh, even fourteen, uh, and to Russia per, per uh, million uh, British thermal units for its uh, gas. Whereas Eastern Med gas could be sold to Turkey at a profit, perhaps for five or six. So it's possible that this will look attractive to Turkey in the future. So a Cyprus settlement is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the development of these resources and their export uh, to or through Turkey. Thank you. We have time for some questions. Do we have any uh, questions? Yes, please. Thanks, Rachel, and thank you, Surly, for coming to share your welcome and thanks for your presentation. Um, a question of mine is uh, about floating liquefied natural gas. Um, they are becoming commercially viable. I work for a company called Deep Energy and right now, and so we're developing a project that is a liquefied natural gas plant that is actually floating. Um, and so I'm just wondering, I, I don't know, at the time, do you think it is not commercially viable for the region because it does provide a lot of flexibility. Uh, it does provide the gas to get to markets in Asia specifically where gas prices are three times higher than United States and twice as high as Europe. So I just want to hear what your thoughts on our floating liquefied natural gas plant in the region that can move from field to field. Thanks for your question um, and, and thanks for your welcome. I'm very happy to be here with you this evening. Um, floating natural gas uh, plant has been a, a hypothesis that has been looked into. And there was a, a, the point is that um, there's nowhere in Israel where um, an LNG plant could be built even if it were commercially uh, viable to do so. The coast is too narrow, the ecological objections would be too strong, and in the case of Cyprus for the time being, there's not sufficient gas anyway. So a uh, floating uh, natural gas plant has been considered. Um, an Australian company, as you probably know, might have become involved with the consortium in Israel, but pulled out because it wasn't convinced by this. And I think the Israelis um, have technical concerns for the time being, although some projects have been developed, I'm not sure that any of them is actually functioning yet as a commercial proposition. So in fact, FLNG, um, th th there is no precedent anywhere in the world of its successful operation until now, although in principle there's no reason why it uh, could not be developed. As I understand it, these uh, FLNG uh, platforms are very large, uh, would be a very conspicuous uh, offshore target. There might be security concerns. So I think for a range of technical and uh, financial and commercial and security reasons that until now, um, this has not been seen as a viable proposition. You've spoken a lot about how the developments in Cyprus may affect um, both in terms of when the gas may be able to be exported as well as whom or which uh, state it may be uh, exported to, which nation state and which country. Um, my question is, there's so much going on in the European Union in terms of Brexit, in terms of the migration crisis, it seems like there's so many balls up in the air. What other types of crises in Europe do you think may impact 
both Cyprus and Israel in their ability to exploit their natural resources. What happens, for example, how the referendum in the UK will go, or what would happen if the migration crisis gets worse? Um, in terms of the backdrop of that, how do you see that playing? And I'd like to get both of your perspectives and both of your expertise on it. Um, yes, the, the, the <laughs> EU is beset by, by crises, or as I prefer to call them, disorders. I think one of the, I think back to my political science courses, a crisis is acute, short, sharp, requires an urgent uh, solution. And in fact, the problems you've been mentioning are unfortunately long-term problems that have been with us for a while and will remain with us for the future. So the EU's uh, capacity for decision in other areas, such as energy policy, is certainly held back um, by all the doubts and uncertainties because of the issues that you mentioned. And these issues, uh, you might have thrown in the Ukraine-Russia problem, uh, which is a great concern to some of the eastern member states like Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and so on. Um, it does affect the capacity to, to focus on other policy areas and to take uh, major decisions. We're talking here about major public-private uh, uh, cooperation on, on investment projects that would run into the uh, double-figure billion uh, dollars. And uh, I do think that um, the, the current situation in Europe means that this is not a top of the agenda. And at the same time, there is no real shortage of energy for now in Europe. So what we're talking about is planning for a future. Any project here would have a payback period of 15 to 20 years. And uh, the crises you mentioned uh, require decisions rather quickly. So the fact of the matter is, I think, this policy area is a little bit on the back burner. Um, uh, the whole question of uh, energy union and uh, public support for infrastructure projects to build a single energy market, um, as long as some of these other dilemmas uh, are not resolved. Now, if some of these went the wrong way, and in particular the question of Britain, um, not to dwell on that, I am a little publicity spot giving a talk on this at DePaul University tomorrow evening, if you happen to be free. <laughs> Thanks to Andy as well, who, who, who arranged that. But I think all the cards would be thrown up in the air if the British voted on the 23rd of June to leave um, the European Union. I hope and trust and almost believe this will not happen, <laughs> but all kinds of last minute developments could affect this. Um, a major terrorist attack, a new huge surge in migration, or another Panama Papers scandal a, a week before the referendum. So I think it's very hard to be confident of the outcome, even though the opinion polls are tending to suggest now that the Remain campaign is stronger than the Leave campaign. But thinking the unthinkable, if the UK were to leave, first of all, the European agenda would be dominated by negotiations about this, at least for the next two years. And secondly, the EU would be seriously weakened if um, the United Kingdom, which is its second largest uh, economy, uh, were, were to leave. And I think the, the blow to the EU's uh, morale and uh, its weight in international negotiations uh, would be significantly um, reduced. So any one of the crisis areas that you mentioned, uh, Brexit, um, a new surge in migration, a new Euro crisis, which I hope and believe, again, will not occur in the next couple of years at least, but there are uncertain factors there too, um, would affect uh, the, the capacity of the EU's member states and the institutions uh, to deliberate uh, on these matters and to give them the priority that uh, perhaps they deserve. I recently, first of all, I have a short question. Has uh, has there been any uh, the limitation of the exclusive economic zones between Israel and Egypt? Is there? I, I, I don't uh, know. Um, and um, uh, also, I would like to mention a couple of developments, recent developments that I heard about. One was that um, Chenier, the, the American. Uh, company has just uh, shipped its first 
shipment of gas uh, to the uh, to Portugal, I think, to Europe. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, the U.S., uh, which was previously an importer of, of uh, energy of gas, uh, is uh, now in a position to export quite uh, a large amount of gas due to developments, shell gas development, and so on. Uh, and this, to me, um, is a very important development in the, uh, what uh, you mentioned, the market uh, factors. Even if we have all political developments positive, it, um, still we have to have uh, the market to be willing to invest. Uh, this uh, ability of the U.S. to export to Europe and to the rest of the world uh, so much and at such cheap prices, actually the price uh, I saw was much lower than the um, Russian, uh, a little lower than the Russian price, the price of uh, the Russian selling gas and of course much lower than uh, the Asian uh, markets. So this is one development that I, I, I expect would affect uh, developments as regards investment in the field. The other, uh, which I'm not very sure about, but I saw a news piece that uh, IDGI is being um, restarting. Uh, it was uh, um, an old plan that would take gas from Russia uh, through Turkey uh, to Southern Europe. But uh, because of the uh, problems in Russia-Turkey relations, the recent uh, problems, now the Russians want to get involved uh, and want to go through Bulgaria. Uh, and it, there is um, a first meeting that happened sometime recently uh, to revive that. I don't know how this is just, uh, you know, how valid this is. Uh, and sometimes such moves may just be um, a political move that, that is <laughs> not really, there's no uh, substance uh, in that. I don't know. Maybe it's too much too much gas in Europe now with the, the transatlantic pipeline, I mean, in South in the region. And LNG uh, 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 plants uh, being built all over the place. That's all. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. No, no, not at all. That's a lot. And so, and that, and any final comments? Well, thank you, uh, Consul General. In fact, you have to a certain degree answered your own question, I think, um, to, towards the end of, uh, of your remarks. Um, let's just take them uh, one by one. U.S. exports of uh, LNG to Europe scarcely begun for the time being, but if they really build up, yes, this will be an additional source of supply. For the time being, because of the cost differential between gas and coal, the ironical situation is that actually Europe is importing large quantities of coal from the United States, beginning with Germany. And given that Germany is closing down its nuclear plants and has a strong uh, policy of taxation-based subsidies for renewables, it's very ironic that it has built up its imports of gas and has actually had to take out of service a number of its gas-fired power stations because it's just not cost effective and doesn't compete with coal for the time being. So I think uh, the prospect of future exports of gas from the United States would add to overall um, demand. Now, depending on what happens to the European economy, considering for the time being that growth is extremely um, anemic and uh, demand for energy is therefore down, I don't think for now there is uh, demand for additional sources of gas uh, at the moment. It's more a question of diversification of the sources than um, increased overall uh, quantities. I think that um, the game that Russia plays with Turkey and with Greece and the countries in Southeast Europe 
is, as you suggested yourself, more political than genuinely rooted in um, real investment decisions. The whole notion of Turkish stream was completely abstract. Um, there had been no investment decisions, there had been no even um, uh, feasibility uh, studies done. Um, it was uh, conceptual. And this was the uh, Russian response to the, uh, well, the, 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 the competition uh, case brought against Russia by the European Commission, the decision then by uh, Russia to cancel South Stream. And I think the whole notion of Turkish Stream was to show, well, look, we have other options. But it never really uh, materialized. So then last November, with the shooting down of the Russian plane, so this would not be pursued further. But what would not be pursued further never existed in the first place. Um, so it is uh, entirely political. Now we know that um, Russia is doing whatever it can to uh, improve its relations with Greece and with Greece's neighbors in the Balkans. Uh, Mr. Putin has declared this year to be the year of Greece. And uh, there's uh, um, various visits uh, coming up. And therefore, in this context, there's nothing easier than to say uh, that Russia has a strong interest in building a new pipeline um, um, that would lead to south southeastern Europe. But once again, this is a pure uh, pipe dream. I don't think there's any substance to it. It's a little bit dust in the eyes, and it's mainly meant to suggest there could be competition to the Southern Corridor, which is real and which is being constructed and will actually take place. So I don't think this is to be taken seriously. I think it's a political gesture more than anything. Maybe if there's any uh, questions, you can grab them very quickly sure. on the way out. But please join me in thanking Sir Michael Lee for a terrific presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much.